Generation 7 ROM hacking is a fairly uncharted space. Did you know that there is only one difficulty hack of the original Sun and Moon in existence? Well now, there's two. Pokemon Mesa Moon is a brand new Gen 7 ROM hack with a ton of enhancements, including diverse move, boss, fight, quality of life, and Pokemon changes. This hack was created by my good friend and famous Reddit poster Albob. For this run, I'll be playing with standard hardcore Nuzlocke rules as well as the additional restriction of banning setup moves such as Dragon Dance and Swords Dance. Normally, I am a little more restrictive, but the balancing in this game intrigued me as a ton of moves are reworked, so I decided to keep everything else on the table. Mesa Moon also gives enemy teams full EV sets, so I'll be using EVs for this run, which I normally don't. Because this hack is so new, I'll be going more in depth with my analysis so that hopefully I can persuade you to play it too. Mesa Moon has revamped the Gen 7 experience from the ground up, and that begins with starter selection. Each starter has their own set of enhancements, so I'll go through all three. The Rowlet line has some stat redistribution, gaining speed, and losing special attack. Dekadui is pretty heavily reworked, with access to no guard in moves like Thousand Arrows, Grass Whistle, High Jump Kick, Power Whip, and its signature Spirit Shackle. Decidueye is also one of the best Z-Move users in the game, as its signature Z-Move, Sinister Arrow Raid, is a high-powered guaranteed flinch move, effectively giving you a consistent free turn of powerful stab damage provided that you're faster than the opponent. It sits in the box for a lot of the mid-game, but comes alive in the late game and Elite Four. The Lidden line loses a bit of special attack in return for a little extra bulk and speed. It still gets Intimidate, which is very useful with the amount of battle armor users in this hack. Incineroar has a pretty unique toolkit featuring moves like Fake Out, Parting Shot, Flare Blitz, and its signature move, Darkest Larian. It's my overall least favorite starter, but the role it plays is very hard to replicate. The Poplio line also gets an interesting treatment, gaining a bit of bulk at the expense of its lesser physical attack stat. That seems fairly standard, but what isn't standard is its ability. This guy gets access to Berserk, which boosts the user's special attack by one stage when knocked under 50% health. This works well with moves like Draining Kiss and its signature Sparkling Aria, which is changed to a spread damage healing move. I choose Poplio for this run for its viability into some of the hardest fights in the game and the Elite Four. Mesa Moon's early game is pretty tame and inviting, and we get things rolling with a round of encounters. We start with a Krogunk on Route 1, and this line has a valuable immunity ability with dry skin, buff speed, and a nice utility kit. At the trainer school, we grab a Bonsley, an excellent early game encounter. Stunky in Howoldy City is our next guy, which is a really good early game poison type. The first fight in Howoli is a face-off with a Lima, which is super free, and then we head to Route 2 where we can grab Fomantis. This is another good early game guy with a nice utility kit. It also keeps Contrary, so you can do all the funny stuff later on, although I won't be allowing it for this run. In the cemetery, I pick up Ralt, which is just okay. I ultimately do choose Gallade later on, but I think Gardevoir would have been a better choice overall. Barring it having like insane Gallade IVs, I think you, you'd rather go Gardevoir. Being a fairy type helps it a lot, and it matches up better into more fights and uses Trace a little more effectively. At this point, we're approaching the first totem fight. Totems in this game are thoroughly reworked. Totem Pokemon are now massively bulky, sporting monstrous HP and defensive stats. In the vanilla games, most of the totem battles are trivialized by cheesy strategies like Toxic Stall. To help combat this, totem Pokemon are given abilities like Magic Bounce, but have their speed dropped to literal 1 to kind of balance all of this out. I think it generally works and makes them a little more interesting in practice. The totem Pokemon also keep their aura boosts as well, so the upcoming totem Raticate spawns with a defense boost for example. The totem rat leaps down from its cliff and it's time to fight. You can get health feathers to HP invest at this point, so we lead with a maxed HP crow brawler found in the berry fields. I go for a rock smash to negate the defense boost as Raticate screeches. The ally Noibat comes in, but this thing does nothing, so I just brick break the rat to KO it. After the rat goes down, I bring in Poplio and shit on the Noibat with it, winning us our first trial. I will say, this game does have a bit of a learning curve. As someone who wasn't super familiar with Gen 7 and some of its unique mechanics, I did make a few blunders in the earlier attempts.
Alright, calls the ally Pokemon. Wait. It didn't show up. Following the trial, I get my Verdant Cavern encounter, a Lolan Diglett which has Sandstream. This is a good encounter, but also a very important dupe that enables a lot of later encounter routing. On Route 3, I grab a Noibat of my own. Noivern is an absolutely sick encounter with a ton of speed and great special attack. These do rely on IVs a bit, but a good one is, well, really good. Before we enter Melee Melee Meadow, we have our first showdown with Hao. Although this fight is, like most things in the early game, very easy. After that, we grab two more encounters, the first of which is a Cottony. I got this thing damn near every attempt and it was consistently good. The Cottony line has two different niches, the first of which is Prankster Utility, which is always great. However, its second ability is a lot more interesting. This guy gets access to Fluffy as well, which makes it a great physical wall. It's still fast, so most of its status moves are going first anyway. Ways. You do get ability capsules later, which allow you to change between the two, although that's not for a bit, so my Cottony will have Prankster for the time being. Seaward Cave gives the player a good shot at an Ice type, and I roll Amora. Believe it or not, Aurorus is one of the best encounters here. It got some serious stat buffs and has insane damage output with Refrigerate. Don't let the typing fool you, this thing is awesome. The first Island Kahuna fight is up next, where we take on the fighting type specialist, Hala. Hala's most interesting Pokemon is definitely his Munchlax, who's got a Custat Berry and the potential to unleash a double power Retaliate. Hala leads with a Poliwhirl, who is countered easily by Fomantis. I hit a hard Razor Leaf into it, as Fomantis takes very little from a Vacuum Wave. A Berry Juice keeps it healthy, and the AI decides to switch next turn. I'll go more in depth later, but the Gen 7 AI is more likely to switch than a lot of older generations. There are a lot more conditions for it, and they are much easier to meet. Luckily, I get a Leech Sheet off into the incoming Monferno. I'm baiting a flame wheel, so I switch into Noibat, and I can come in and outspeed and kill with an air cutter. This brings in Munchlax, who I counter with the now evolved Pseudo Wudo. This is one of the best Munchlax counters, and has the defensive prowess to take it on while having great coverage with low kick to hit it hard. This baits the Poliwhirl back in, and I go back into Fomantis to 1v1. Noibat can then come in to deal with the Cabrawler and finish up the Kahuna fight. We head over to Akala Island, where we are almost immediately thrust into a fight with Cena although her team of ice types is very easy to deal with. Following the fight, we unlock another encounter on Route 4, Sneasel. My good buddy Sandow, who was also running this game around the time I was, told me that Sneasel was bad. In fact, he went as far as saying sorry about Weavile. The funny thing is, we were going to have absolutely nothing to be sorry about. As we head to Paniola Town, the second showdown with How awaits. Fomantis with Brick Break counters the lead screen setting Pikachu, Amara beats the Togetic, Grab Brawler comes in on the Eevee's Z workup and retaliates with a fighting type Z move of its own. Z moves have their base powers adjusted so that they're not super broken in the hands of the player. This in turn means that they are also easier to switch into. It's surprisingly well balanced considering how broken a lot of the gimmicks in Pokemon are. I bring Sudowoodo in on the Torque Cat, use Rock Tomb, and then finish it off with Poplio. In Paniola Ranch, we encounter a Mudbray, a great encounter with excellent bulk and Elite Four potential down the road. We also get an Eevee Hang, which we hatch in Hehe he City. Eevee can go a lot of ways in this game, with Vaporeon being my preferred choice. This guy also holds an Eevee Light, which will be very useful in the meantime. On Route 5, we have our first showdown with Gladion. This is the first fight in the game that can get a little fictitious, since rocks can go up and the Type Null in the back can phase you with Roar. I lead with Amora and bait Spark into Mudbray to bypass Luxio's Intimidate. I can then two hit KO with Stomp. A Rock Smash from Crabrawler can kill Sneasel through the Chopperberry. Sneasel can switch in and frag Gligar, and then the Rock Ruff hits the field. My plan is to 1v1 it in clear hazards with Prankster Cottony, but my plan goes awry as Cottony gets crit flinched, meaning that I have to deal with the Type Null while rocks are up. Pseudo Wudo can come in and beat the Rock Ruff and threatens the Type Null with Low Kick. I spend a couple minutes getting phased and almost get my Cottony killed in the process, but eventually I can kill it with Amora. Glad I got out of that unscathed. Before the totem wishy-washy, Surf is unlocked, so I backtrack to get another round of encounters. In Akala Outskirts, I grab Piplup, which is really good, and Polion has very minor buffs stat-wise, but gains the ability competitive, which suits it very well. 
and Mele Mele C, I pick up a Lolan Grimer, an excellent encounter, a Lolan Muck has Regenerator and Amazing Poison Dark Typing. Lastly, in 10 Carat Hill, I pick up Trap Inch, a personal favorite of mine, although Flygon does not see a lot of use in this run unfortunately. Second totem fight is against Wishy Washy. It does keep Wishy Washy's signature schooling ability, so there's a lot more opportunities for cheese here. I'll spare you the details, but we use the combination of Leech Seed from Fomantis, Sandstream from Diglett, and Dry Skin from Krogunk to totally stall this thing out. The ally Morlol doesn't do much, so this fight is pretty trivial. After the trial is complete, we unlock Fishing, and I do so in Brooklet Hill and reel up a Corsola. This guy has some major stat buffs, but also serves as a great dupe for Route 9's fishing pool. I backtrack one more time to Kalai Bay, another route I delayed, and fish up a Horsey. This is one of the few ROM hacks that gives Kingdra some love, and it's plenty good in this. I head back up to Paniola Town and fish up a Remoraid, which turns into my favorite fire type, Octillery. Route 6 gives us a Luxio, which is solid. On Route 7, I pick up a Lowland Graveler, which is really good, and in Wella Park, I grab Salandit. With a reloaded box, we now face the first potential run killer in the game, Totem Salazzle. This is a really well designed fight, as the pair of the ally Salandit and Totem Salazzle spread poison with corrosion and poison gas and then punish you with critical hits from Merciless. Leech Seed Stall is suboptimal here to say the least, since most grass types get shredded by this thing. It will also call an infinite amount of Salandits, so there's no use in killing the allied Pokemon. This is what I would say is the first truly difficult fight in the game. My plan was to lead with a pre-burn Seedra and Rain Dance on turn 1. In case you didn't notice or see, my Seedra is not burnt, nor does it know Rain Dance. Oops, I for gore. So uh, it's time to gamble. I switch in Brion, dodge some crits, and set up Brain. Octillery can come in and get some solid damage off. I then rotate around, dodging some more crits in the process, and eventually kill Salazzle with Seedra and Salandit with Amora. This fight had a little more of a concrete plan in mind, although it didn't exactly go well here because of my, uh, blunder. That certainly made the fight harder than it needed to be. I head out to Route 8 to grab a guaranteed Wimpod, which is an awesome encounter. Galissapod's ability is an excellent creator of free switches, not to mention that it has the best priority in the game in first impression. This is also where you can get ability capsules and the rest of the feathers to complete your EV sets as trainers will start to have full EV spreads in the upcoming splits. I also delayed my Route 5 encounter for the ambush section, where I pick up a Scorpi, a very likely encounter considering that I had the early Diglett dupe. Drapion with battle armor is excellent in this and also has access to tough claws if you want it for the nice little power. Power boost. After that, it's time to take on the fourth totem Pokemon, Lorantis. Lorantis has a status immunity from Flower Veil vale and can call an ally Cherum at above two thirds of its HP, which sets up Sun to enable 75% synthesis healing and one turn Solar Blades. Cherum's ability Flower Gift also plays into this, giving it an attack and special defense boost in the Sun. All that being said, this fight is much easier than Slazzle in my opinion, even without the cheese that I am about to unleash. This totem gets absolutely shat on by Aurorus, who baits the two-turn Solar Blade into itself and then does massive damage with the Refrigerate Hyper Voice. This also summons the ally Sudowoodo, which does less than half to the big dino with a Brick Break. We score a clean two-hit KO on Lorantis and finish off Sudowoodo with Mudsdale. Following the trial, I grab Vulpix in Lush Jungle. Ninetales is Fire Fairy and has access to Drought, and while that sounds great, it's pretty underwhelming in practice. I delayed the Diglett's Tunneling encounter for ambush as well, and with the Diglett dupe, I grab jangmo o which evolves into a battle armor combo. Just outside of Koni Koni City on Route 9, we can fish and grab Oshawott. This is another solid encounter, as Samurott has no guard and can spam a bunch of powerful and normally inaccurate special attacks with literally zero drawback. We are also at the point in the game where you get access to evolution stones and fossils. I choose to delay my fossil encounter in this run, but on the newest patches, there's no longer a reason to. I grab two more encounters counters in Stuffle and Audino, and then proceed to the first of two upcoming boss fights. Lumeria 1 is the first Team Skull admin fight. This is pretty clearly designed around Toxic Spikes, with Merciless on 2 Mons and Venishock on 3. It goes without saying, but hazard prevention is pretty important here. I lead with a pre-damaged Dugtrio. Because my only way to kill Skuntank is using Dig, I need to bait out a kill from it so that it doesn't use Toxic Spikes. I go under as it tries to attack, and then KO on the second turn. By leading with Dougie, we also set Sand, which allows Aurorus to 1v1 the incoming Salazzle with the special defense boost. Toxic 
Apex gets one shot by Strongjaw Luxray, and the incoming Haunter is dealt with by Drapion. I sucker punch it down to the Sash, and then spam Toxic Spikes to sell it out of Destiny Bonds and eventually kill it. Lastly, the Saviper comes in, and I can underspeed to safely activate the red card and then switch into Corsola, which sits on this thing pretty well, and 1v1s to get us the win. Olivia is the second island kahuna. She's got a stacked roster of rock and ground types as well as sun support from the soul rock. I think every Pokemon on her team can be threatening, but what you struggle with has more to do with your box than anything else. I lead with Beware, who counters Jaramaldo very well. I'm anticipating a switch AI here, since the Rock Ghost Lunatone has an immunity to Drain Punch and super effective coverage in Dazzling Gleam, and we get it after a few turns since it's not guaranteed immediately. While Dazzling Gleam affects the switch AI, because of Beware's fluffy ability, Mystical Fire rolls just as high, and that's what it does on my Alolan Muck switch in. We can hit a hard crunch into Shadow Sneak to take it out. This baits in the nasty Sheer Force Camera Upt, and I can switch in Galissapod on Earth Power and KO with Razor Shell. Multi Scale Kingdra can beat the Soul Rock. Vaporeon can come in on Minior, Set Rain, and straight up frag it with Z Water Pulse. And then it chains of the weak Armaldo and Golem to clean up the fight. This concludes our time on Akala Island, and we set sail toward Ula Ula, with our first stop being Melee City. Shortly after landing, we are challenged by Hao for a third time. Hao leads with Raichu, which immediately dies to first impression. Hao's Togekiss is fodder for Empoleon as it hits a Mystical Fire, gives Empoleon a special attack boost, and allows for Emp to Oko it. This baits out the Torcat, and Vaporeon can come in, eat a Thunderfang at over half, and outrun it for a clean kill. The Big Crab can then 1v1 the Sligu, Auroras beats the Komala, and Glizzapod comes back in to first impression the Leafeon, winning us the fight. Now, it's time for more encounters. First, we grab Vullaby and Melee Garden, then Magnemite and Melee proper. Route 11 gives us a Viper, which is Poison Dragon with multi-scale in this. On Route 10, we go for Ambush for the elusive Bug Dragon Gen Mega. This thing is insane in this game. It has effectively infinite speed and great matchups into a lot of this game's most intense section. On Mount Hogolani, I pick up the aforementioned Rock Ghost Lunatone, which is very good as well. Molane is the gatekeeper of the next trial and runs a team of steel types. With the exception of his demon Togedemaru, this fight is pretty easy and we win with no casualties. As I alluded to earlier, it's time for our next totem battle. We face off against Vikavolt, whose fight is designed around electric terrain. This guy also gets an Omni Boost on Switch In, which is something else to make note of. It can call one of two allied Pokemon. The first is a Charger Bug who runs an Eviolite, sets electric terrain, and then boosts up Vikavolt further with its battery ability. The second Pokemon is Rotom Wash, which is more immediately threatening and sets terrain for longer due to its terrain extender item. This fight is one long stall, so I'll try to be brief. Basically, I lead with Ninetales to damage Vigavolt and get it below two thirds of its health so that it calls the Rotom. With Sutton up, Vigavolt and Rotom always Thunderbolt onto the incoming Doug Trio switch in, which sets sand and allows for a full on sand stall using Toxicroak, Doug Trio, and Mudsdale. Once Vigavolt is dead, I bring in Lorantis to kill Rotom, winning us the fight. The first Guzma fight is up next, and it's a good one. Guzma leads with Galissapod, and I lead with Magneton to outspeed and activate Emergency Exit. This brings in Larvesta and I pivot through pre-slept Sudowoodo to ensure that it always goes for X-Scissor into my pre-damaged Noivern, activating its Berserk ability. Noivern then takes 3 kills and switches out using a Held Shed Shell on the Shadow Tag Ariados. Galissapod comes in to take the kill with first impression. Alolum beats the shiny Charger Bug, and Salazzle can come in on Big P and take it out with a Z-Move. Now, we get another round of encounters. On Route 12, I grab Heatmore, a Fire Steel type with Tough Claws in this game. In Secluded Shore, I get Surskit, grab Chinchu on Route 13, Magikarp on Route 14, Electric Poison Tynamo on Route 15, Alolan Sansaru in Tabu Village, and lastly, Probopass in Blush Mountain. This puts us right in line for the 6th totem fight, Mimikyu. This fight is pretty interesting since the Mimikyu is incredibly hard to damage due to its Omni Boost and Disguise ability. At above 2 thirds of its health, it calls an ally Shadow Tag Chandelure. This fight does have one really exploitable loophole though, and it's that if you can get rid of the Chandelure, this Mimikyu is totally vulnerable to good old fashioned Toxic Stall. 
I lead with Gyarados to intimidate and nullify the raised attack stat from the Omni Boost. Then I switch into Octillery on a resisted play rough. I'm EV to outspeed the incoming Chandelure, and I can eliminate it with a Hydro Vortex Z move. I then bring in Skuntank to get the Toxic off, and then, well, it's a Toxic stall from here on out. Once Mimikyu dies, Luxray takes out the Banet, an earth shattering strategy and really legacy defining moment. Dude, what is your opinion on Team Magma's goals? They're hilarious. But I guess the real question you have to ask yourself is, if Team Magma's goals were accomplished, how would it affect LeBron's legacy? Before anything else happens, we grab a new encounter in the abandoned Megamart, Honedge. Aegislash has its stats nerfed a bit in this game, but it's still really, really good. Up next is our second duel with Plumeria. And this go around, things are a little more interesting. She leads with a Focus Sash hazard setting Rose Raid, but this is fodder for the unfortunate Weavile who kills with Fake Out into Ice Punch. This baits in her demonic Serena. And I use Toxicoke, holding an eject button to generate a free switch. You're gonna start seeing these guys pop up more often, but eject buttons are viable in this game. I was on the fence about allowing them, and I did my first few runs without them, but I came around to it. Allow me to explain my reasoning. Unlike some other hacks, enemy teams in this game are built with full EV spreads, max IVs, and ideal natures. This means that frail offensive Pokemon usually have to hit certain IV thresholds to even see the light of day. This, in conjunction with PP nerfs to status moves and the removal of the TM for Toxic, creates a meta around bulky offense. Since every enemy offensive Pokemon has investment into attacking stats and speed, Hyper Offense is a very difficult playstyle to pull off in Mesa Moon. To help enable this, the developer added these eject buttons in to diversify the playstyle and give the offensive threats some more viability by generating switches for them. And after playing with the eject buttons for some time, I get it. It's strong, but does require good planning to pull off safely, and the most Hyper Offensive Pokemon would really struggle without it. Alright, let's get back to the fight. Yen Mega gets in for free and detects free speed boost. I kill Serena with Aeroblast, then chain the Viper with Dragon Pulse. I get Magazone in on Ice Beam and stay in, killing with an analytic boosted Thunderbolt. Freeze has also been removed from the game, so Ice Beam has a chance to drop a special attack. I had a plan for it had that happened. This baits in Salazzle, and I go into Vaporeon to set rain, eject out, and enable Swift Swim King Throat to clean up the rest of the fight. Before the next major split, we can grab some new encounters like Pharaseed, Petalil, and Torkoal. Arriving in Po Town unlocks one of the most brutal splits in the game. Welcome to the Aether Prison, a dungeon of 7 consecutive boss fights with no new encounters until you escape. This split also features some of the nastiest undocumented trainers in the game. Haunter. This is what I love seeing. Haunter. Golbat. Oh! The first fight in Aether Prison is Guzma 2. He's got a heinous lineup of bugs and a nasty arena trapping Flygon. Guzma's lead Galissapod is pretty exploitable as I can outrun it and knock it into emergency exit with Magnezone. This brings in the arena trap Flygon and I can switch out with a Shed Shell and bring in Yen Mega on guaranteed EQ. I detect for a speed boost, kill Flygon with Dragon Pulse, kill Durant with a 100% accuracy heat wave, and Galissapod with another Dragon Pulse. This time the Ariados has Analytic and not Shadow Tag, so I can switch into No Guard Samrot, which ensures the incoming Megahorn hits to eject button out into the Lissapod and kill with first impression. The Vicavolt is the only risky interaction of the entire fight, and I have to beat it with Battle Armor Kamo. -O. There's definitely a good amount of fiction possible since Bug Buzz and Thunderbolt have overlapping roles, and drops or paralysis can put me in a really bad spot. Kamo -O frauds the ever living piss out of this thing, getting the confusion with Rock Climb and causing Vicavolt self hit. Lastly, Ninetales comes in on Parasect and shreds it with Inferno Overdrive. Gladion 2 is up next, and I lead with the Fat Bear as Gladion leads with Weavile. Beware straight up mogs this thing, scoring a kill with two mock punches. The incoming Rock Dark type Lycanroc Midnight gets absolutely shredded by another mock punch. This baits in Strong Jaw Luxray, and we can hard switch into Dug Trio on Psychic Things and Earthquake to take it out. Aerialate Gliscor comes in next, and I switch in on EQ for free and proceed to mog this thing with Probo Pass. Type Null comes in, and I use BA Kamo to eject into Gallade, which takes the kill. Lastly, Mudsdale beats Lucario, winning us the second battle of the prison. The final fight on Ula Ula Island and the third in the prison is the Kahuna Nanu, a dark type specialist with a ton of nasty coverage. Nanu's lead Honchkrow is pretty nasty, but Alolum is a good counter, eating the superpower and killing it with a rock climb into Galvanize Quick Attack. 
I use Whimsicott to eject on the incoming Crocodile and bring in Yen Mega for free. This guy can chain kills on Crocodile, Feraligator, and Greninja. Zygarde beats the Drapion, and lastly, Mudsdale beats the Alolan Muck, winning us the last fight on Ula Ula Island. We then sail to the Aether Foundation facility and have a single battle with Faba, but this fight is cleaned up by Weavile and Noivern. Very difficult. This brings us to the next big run killer in Mesa Moon. Once you clear through some more of the Aether Foundation, you are jolted into a 12v11 tag battle versus Faba and Lulu. Al is interesting as a partner, as he likes to set up screens for you, which helps, but he, like any tag battle partner, can also throw your fight like crazy. Faba's psychic types are all pretty threatening, but Lulu's team has the real demons. First, she's got an Alolan Ninetales, which can set its own Aurora Veil. Then, she's got a nasty Beardic, Dragon type. Lapras, Rotom Freeze with coverage out the ass, and last but certainly not least, a Choice Specs Refrigerate Glaceon that does a ton of damage by locking itself into Hyper Voice. There's very few fights that emphasize the bulky offense meta in Mesa Moon more than this one. My team composition is as follows. Torkoal is here to underspeed Ninetales and set Sun. Drapion and Alolan Muck are my tanky poisons with great abilities in Battle Armor and Regenerator, respectively. Empoleon is here for the Ice types mostly, and this fat ass penguin does some good work here. Aegislash has a lot of tech into this fight, and its versatility gets put on full display here. Lastly, my Prim Starter is on the team, with its insane special bulk and ability to abuse the Berserk plus Sparkling Aria combo. As mentioned earlier, I lead with Torkoal to underspeed the Ninetales and set Sun. Raichu sets up a light screen for me as two blizzards come out. Torkoal lets off a massive sun boosted flamethrower to then kill Ninetales. Lapras comes in next and I'm assuming this is a double into the low HP Raichu so I take a free turn to attack but of course it's a psychic into drop into dragon pulse all into my Torkoal slot which is insanely fictitious. Torkoal barely does any damage because psychic drops both special stats in this kind of like gen 1. How then decides to switch AI into Gudra while I switch into Monk. Of course, Hao switches the Gudra into Blizzard as Dragon Pulse hits Muck for a bit of damage. Jinx keeps spamming Blizzards as Gudra kills Lapras with a Dragon Pulse. Muck gets Jinx down to the Sash as the Demon Rotom enters the field. I switch in my Drapion on two spread moves and realize that I forgot to give it special defense investment and barely live both with battle armor. Between the switch AI, random moves, and that, we're not off to a great start. I protect Drapion as Jinx and Rodon decide to not kill the 24 HP Drapion and instead attack Komala, who then KOs Jinx with Shadow Claw. Oranguru is out next, so it's back into Muk as Hao switch AIs again and brings in Leafeon of all things. Hao almost switches it into a Blizzard, but the Leafeon dodges it, which is a fucking miracle. Oranguru then Focus Blast and Spadef drops the Leafeon. Leafeon gets a nasty wood hammer off and then Rotom sends it to meet Jesus. Muk then hits a big knockoff to get rid of Rotom's life orbs and dodges a crit hyper voice. Hao's Incineroar is out next and I'm in a bad spot. It's Aegislash time as we come in on a weak Thunderbolt. Thankfully, Hao doesn't throw and kills Orin Guru. Hypno is out next and this thing is annoying but doesn't do much, so I decide to sneak Rodom as Incineroar hits a Fire Punch but takes a Focus Blast. Beardick is in next, so it's a King Shield angle, and then Incineroar just fucking dies. Hao brings in Raichu here, which will die to a Soft Breeze, but it straight up frags Beardick with an Aura Sphere and then AG can take care of Hypno with Shadow Claw. Gallade and the Specs Glaceon hit the field and we're almost out of here. I King Shield again and Raichu takes another kill on Glaceon. Raichu then goes down to Gallade. Hao's last Pokemon is Togekiss and I bring in the big Prim to handle business. Gallade hits the Z move into Kiss and it gets eaten and then crits Gallade with an Arrow Blast. Delphox is out next and he takes the kill on Kiss and Prim goes to work, hitting a nasty Aria to take it out. Omala is the last man standing for Hao, and I get a free shot on Bruxish, bring it down to Sash, get AG in on Psychic Fangs, and sneak to KO. That was fun. But the fun isn't over yet, because the final showdown with Guzma is right upon the horizon. This is the nastiest Guzma yet, with the Galissapod in the back and a Quiver Dancing Volk. In earlier attempts, this fight got absolutely nuked by Swellow.
So, if you're wondering why Facade got its base power nerf, that's my bad. Anywho, we're on a new patch this attempt, and things are a little bit different. I lead with a Mega Detect Speed Boost and immediately chain 3 kills on Durant, Flygon, and Guzma's Yen Mega. This baits in the Galissapod, so I bring in Toxic Rope with Rocky Helmet, take the Rock Climb, chip it, and then bring in Electros on a Drill Run. Then I Z move to break through the Galissapod. Volcarona gets beaten by Probo Pass, and I eject the Viper into the Dino to 1v1 the Vicable. This is also where I discovered a bug where Zap Cannon didn't actually paralyze you, but I was fine regardless since I had a Lumberry. Anywho, this got fixed on the latest patch. The last fight of Prison is the first face off with Lusami. This fight is absolutely demonic, and her team is over leveled, but she only has 5 mons in return. The level cap for this fight is 64, but all of her Pokemon are level 70. Lusamine leads with a Clefable, which immediately dies to a Z-move from a Lolan Sandslash. I kept Iron Tail specifically for this fight so that I could have enough power to break through it. The Demon Beware is next, so I Spiky Shield and then bring in Fluffy Whimsicott for maybe the funniest 1v1 of all time. This shit was genuinely hilarious, and I stole this thing out with Leech Seed. Miss Magius is out next, and I use Heatmore's Iron Head into a Bullet Punch combo to beat it. This baits in Earth Power from the incoming Lilligan, so I use Electros to beat it and kill it with a Poison Jab. Lastly, I can and slow volt switch on the Milotic and get my own Lilligant back in for free, which can break through it with Frenzy Plant. Another move I delayed for, with the specific intent of beating this Pokemon. And like that, the prison has been escaped. We're now in the late game, and it's time to reload the box. We get a few encounters in Pony Island, like Shell Armor, Ice Dragon, Lapras, Turtonator, Lombre, and Shieldon. I also hatched an Aerodactyl Egg and revived the Plume Fossil for Archaeops, but I forgot to record it. Anywho, after that round of encounters, it's time for the final Island Kahuna, Hapu. This fight can be really nasty depending on your box. Her lead is scary and it's difficult to guarantee that rocks do not go up. The two flying fossils are here, both of which hit like a truck. Her Mudsdale is very difficult to deal with and her Needle Queen has incredible coverage. But the biggest demon is the Tough Claws Weakness Policy Metagross, which almost nothing can beat safely. This is an insane mon. On attempt 2, I got box checked and had to resort to this crazy trick room line, which you are watching in the background. It went super sideways when I didn't check if an adaptability Aqua Jet killed the Doug Trio and it low rolled. <laughs> Stealth Rocks went up and uh, hey, was almost really bad. I lead with Shell Armor Turtonator to beat her lead, Dugtrio. With Shell Armor, Defense Investment, and a Shuka Berry, I can bring the Dugtrio down to the Sash with Shell Trap and then Rapid Spin the Rocks away. Probo Pass then switches in on a Head Smash from Archaeops, which does nasty damage for a resisted hit. I get crit on the second Head Smash, and after Recoil, we can kill Archaeops with a Power Gem through Sand. A Citrus Berry helps with HP and baiting for the incoming Mudsdale, who goes for a Bulk Up. Lilligan gets in for free and breaks through with the Frenzy Plant. Then, Pengu gets in for free on Nidoqueen Sludge Wave and kills it with Hydro Vortex. Beware, then beats the Aerodactyl with two Mach Punches, and the last Pokemon in is the Demon Metagross. Thankfully, I have Aegislash to beat this as long as I dodge a crit, and I can kill it with a slow Shadow Ball into Shadow Sneak. Fast Pony Canyon has a gauntlet of Ace Trainers to pose as an additional challenge, the first of which is Veteran Harry, who runs a Sun Team. This fight is funny because Aerodactyl chains the first four kills on it all back to back. On the Cast Worm, my Dino gets Solar Beam AI'd, which I find out is a thing in Gen 7. Although with a Rindo Berry, we can live too. Still, it should have Ice Beamed Aerodactyl on the Switch. I suppose it didn't find the kill and then Solar Beam AI'd. Had I known that, I would have pre-damaged Always Be Dead to Ice Beam. Lastly, Kamo can beat the Shift Tree safely and win the fight. I also got an encounter in Vast Pony Canyon, and it's Steel Dragon Lairon, one of the best Pokemon in the game. Agron is really, really good in this with its new Dragon type, and the ability filter. Ace Trainer Hiroshi is the next VPC fight, and this guy has hands. Hiroshi leads with Sheer Force Tauros, and I lead with the bear. He opens with a Sheer Force boosted Blaze Kick, which I shrug off and heal with a Drain Punch. I go for a Mach Punch, but Hiroshi Swish AIs and a Toxic Rogue, who I beat with Mudsdale. Avalug comes in next, and I bring in the Crab, who can beat it by healing itself up with Drain Punch. Dragonite comes in next, and this loses to Probo Pass. Kingdra breaks through Turtonator with Draco Meteor. Beware gets back in to kill Toxic Rogue, and Agron eats a sniper crit when dealing with the Fero in the back. Next up is Ace Trainer Heather, who runs a nasty Trick Room team. Her lead Spiritomb is very difficult to break through, but Prim is one of the few Pokemon in the game that can get past it with a Trinkle Tackle. I go into Electros and Volt Switch into Galissapod, which takes a crit adaptability Crab Hammer and then kills with First Impression. Or not! 
because the switch AI strikes again and brings in Rhyperior, who I just killed with liquidation. I can also chain BHM with X Scissor and then beat Lapras with Pengu. Crawdont comes back in and close combats into Galissapod, which can first impression again to kill it. Last up is Shinotic, who is beaten pretty easily by Probopass. The last VPC trainer is the Rain Specialist, Veteran Eric. I lead with a pre-damaged Torkoal to underspeed, set Sun, and beta Hydro Pump into Chlorophyll Lilligant, who chains three kills. I don't have quite enough juice to kill the High Dragon through its held Rosalie Berry, so I bring an Aerodactyl to beat it and then chain Kingdra. Finally, I beat Fion with Leech Seed Stall from Ferrothorn. After clearing VPC, we can face the final totem fight. This is Totem Kamo. This is also where I wiped in attempt 2 due to some planning errors on my end. This guy's got an Omni Boost, Roselli Berry, and Magic Bounce, which all invalidate a lot of strategies. The ally Scizor is there to set screens, and if you kill the Scizor or hit the Kamo really low turn 1, you will summon an absolutely demonic Tyrantrum. Clanging Scales also has a 20% chance to Omni Boost in this game, so it's not something that you ever want to bait out from the combo. I have one loophole to the whole magic bounce thing, and I plan to use it. I pull out the Switcheroo Archeops to give combo -O a Toxic Orb, and this fight just turns into one big Toxic Stall, so I'll spare the details. But once the big dragon goes down, I beat Scizor with Heatmore, and once that goes down, we've officially completed every trial in Mesa Moon. The next split of the game takes us to outer space, or wherever this is, to go fight Lusamine one last time. Raging Lusamine is the most difficult fight in the game up to this point, and her team is absolutely nuts. Five of her Pokemon have aura boosts, meaning that they get a stat boosted by one stage on switching. Her ace, however, is a different story. It's a level 85 Neoligo with coverage out the ass and a Shuka Berry. There's very few things that can beat this monster, and I'm terrified of it. Lusamine, in her possessed form, leads with a special defense boosted Clefable, who gets one shot by a crit iron head from Heatmore. It didn't really matter though, since a bullet punch would have finished it off anyways, but hey, good luck is always appreciated. I go into Eel on guaranteed earth power, and then P jab to get it to the sash, and then slow volt switch for the kill. I decide to go into Probo to bring in the plus one defense beware. Then I switch to Whimsicott on the hammer arm and beat it the exact same way that we did on Lusamine 1. Good old fashioned leech seed gaming. This baits in the Neoligo, and I go Bassidon into Probo Pass to get the levitating guy in for free. With an Assault Vest, we can only hope to 1v1, and we do so dodging some E-Ball drops amongst other fiction. Then the plus one attack, Adaptability Physical Milotic comes in, which Whimsicott can sit on for a bit. I was actually okay sacking it here, but ended up getting put to sleep, and it gave me a safe switch to Salazzle on the boosted up Twinkle Tackle, so I can just go into that and kill with the Poison Z move. Then Miss Magis comes in, and Bastidon can 1v1 it and kill it with a heavy slam, getting us the elusive Deathless Raging Lusamine. After that final Lusamine encounter, we are rewarded with a Lunala, albeit with some nerfed stats to make it a little less egregious. Lunala is a pretty common Elite Four Pokemon in this game, mostly due to its Shadow Shield ability, which gives it a lot of good matchups. There's one more Gladion fight at the base of Mount Nalanquila, but honestly, it's super free. Before the League, there's just one more battle with Hal, and we gotta take care of business one final time time. I beat the Leafeon with Weavile, Alolan Raichu with Aegislash, Incineroar with a no guard focus blast from Samurott, baiting in Komala. Komala gets 1v1 by Beware, and I take care of Togekiss with Alolan Sandslash. Lunala then gets to 1v1 Gudra, marking the entirety of Lunala's usage this run. Mesa Moon's E4 is batshit insane. Every fight is turned up to the absolute max, with some of the nastiest threats in the entire game. It's a far cry from the inviting early game. This is hell. But I wouldn't be maybe the 33rd best Nuzlocker in the world if I didn't have a plan. So we put together a team. First up is our starter, Pat Mahomes the Primarina, and it does its thing, special bulk, special moves, and healing itself up after Berserk boosts. The second of our waters is Gabe Davis, the Vaporeon. 
This guy sets its own rain and has access to Hydro Cannon, which is basically a water type Draco Meteor, allowing it to break through a few key threats without needing special attack investment. Of course, Vaporeon also doubles as a great special tank, and it has recover as well if necessary. Jalen Waddle, the Beware, is our third team member, a physical tank with its fluffy ability that also wins some key matchups in the league. Liam Eichenberg, the Kamo-O, is fighting type number two. This is the battle armor guy who mostly functions as a safe eject bot, but also wins a few matchups of its own. Mike Allstott, the Mudsdale, is team member number five, and I'm not sure that I've totally done this thing justice over the course of the video, but it's absolutely mental. Mudsdale's ability stamina boosts its defense stat by one stage for every hit it takes, and it's really, really bulky to begin with, so you kind of just become unkillable on the physical side. And you really don't have to worry about crits for two reasons. First of all, because this thing is super bulky, and and will live damn near any crit as long as it's above half, but also because you can just heal yourself out of crit range with slack off. Yeah, I shit you not, this mod is insane, and it really shines in the Elite Four, but there's one more slot, and it's the Pokemon that this team is really built around. Remember the sorry about Weavile Discord message? Well, Sandow, you are going to owe this thing an apology, because you were not familiar with its game. Derwin James is my primary fragger, and uh, it kills a lot of stuff. As much as the other Pokemon are here to do their own things, they are also here to enable Weavile to chain kills and tear through teams. Seriously, it's that good into this Elite Four. That brings us to the age-old question, can this miscellaneous group of NFL players take on Mesa Moon's Diabolical Elite Four? Time to find out. Acerola is my most consistent matchup, but her team is far from easy. She has two Weather Setters and two Mythicals. Her lead Frostlass can set Aurora Veil, and you probably just lose if it does that. Meloetta can change forms using Relic Song, which can also sleep you, and Marshadow will punish pretty much any attempt at setup and threaten you with its powerful Z move. Acerola also has a Focus Sash, Disguise Mimic you, which can set up as well, and a second Weather Setter in Ninetales. The goal also hits really hard too. This team is full of threats. I underspeed Acerola's lead Frostlass with Vaporeon to gain the weather advantage. I take weak Shadow Ball and break through it with a rain boosted Hydro Cannon. This baits an energy ball from the incoming Meloetta, which Weavile can come in on and take it out with a fake out into throat chop combo. Golurk comes out next, but meets its doom at the hands of a Sub-Zero Slammer. This baits in Acerola's Mimikyu, and I use Rocky Helmet Mudsdale to break the Focus Sash, meaning that I only have to hit it twice with Heavy Slam since I still have to break the Disguise. After taking hit for Mimikyu, I'm dead to the sun boosted flamethrower from the Ninetales, so I bring Vaporeon back in and 1v1 the Ninetales with it. Marshadow is out next, and I go into Kamao to eject button into Primarina. With a Lumberry, I can safely take a Thunder Punch, get knocked into Berserk range while not being dead to crit, and kill Marshadow with plus one Draining Kiss, winning us the fight against Acerola. The next challenge in the Elite Four is Olivia, an absolutely terrifying fight. This team is full of threats like a Hazard and Sand Setting Giga Lith, Sand Rush Exadrill, Assault Vest Steel Dragon Aggron, which is incredibly difficult to beat, Sand Force Garchomp, a Rockhead Recoil Move Spamming Relicanth, and a terrifying Shell Smash Minior. I lead with Weavile to bait a Diamond Storm kill and switch to Vaporeon to regain my weather dominance. Gigalith has buffed special defense, so we need Hydro Cannon to break through it. This brings in Relicanth, who is 1v1 with Kamo-O, who walls it out pretty nicely. We're always safe with some Citrus Recovery and Battle Armor as we shrug off Aqua Tails in the rain, which is reworked in this game to basically be a clone of Wave Crash. This baits in the horrifying Aggron, but we actually have a good counter for it in Beware. There's one small issue. The hack creator reworks Dragon Hammer into a close combat variant, which in turn drops the Aggron's defensive stats. This move was supposed to be replaced by Dragon Rush, but he must have for gore. And while it normally would make this monster easier to beat, it's actually kind of bad for me since I want to be at a certain HP on Beware when the Meteor comes out, and I was planning to wear it down with Drain Punches. But... <sighs> It doesn't work, and an untimely critical hit means that I have to kill it with Mach Punch since I can't risk being at too high of HP. This is important because I do not want the incoming Minior to use Shell Smash. I can bring Vaporeon back in on Aero Blast and then break through Minior with the Hydro Vortex since I need the Z move to get me over the hump. Exodrill comes in next, and I eject in a Beware who has to 1v1 this demon. Because of the HP conundrum, I get knocked super low from Earthquake, which ignores Fluffy because it doesn't make contact. Then, 
I can heal up with a drain punch, bringing the bear back to strength. The extra drill's focus sash is now broken, so a priority mock punch takes the kill. Garchomp is last, and I go to Mudsdale and eject into Weavile for an easy KO. Hala is Elite 4 member number 3, and this is, in my opinion, the hardest fight of the bunch. Hala's lead Passimian is super annoying with a sash and parting shot. The crab is incredibly hard to break through, and Kamo and Halucha are both very threatening in their own right. But there's two notably demonic Pokemon on this roster. The Drompa is really hard to deal with, and absolutely punishes the player if they can't break through it with the Berserk boost that it gets under half. The biggest demon, though, is the Snorlax, which just fully has random AI. This thing can boom on you at any moment's notice. And Explosion is a guaranteed critical hit in this game. With Stab, it's terrifying, especially when there's just no logic to it. Hala decides to attack turn 1 with Pazimian, and I can heal it off with a Draining Kiss from Prim. Turn 2, it decides to Parting Shot, which baits in the Demon Lax. My best answer to this thing is Chilin Berry, Beware, and Prey. I come in on a Crunch, it, see, you can see, you can see the random AI just clicked Crunch on a Fairy type, and uh, we dodge the boom. Crabominable comes in next, and we can swap into Prim on a Dynamic Punch, which doesn't risk confusion since it's reworked in this game. We can then 1v1 it with Prim. Drompa is out next and I eject Kamo o into Weavile to fake out into Icicle Crash, and then I kill Kamo o and Passimian back to back with Weavile. I don't outspeed the Halucha though, so I have to eject again into Mudsdale and pull off a 1v1 to win us the fight against Hala. Kahili is the final fight in the Elite Four, and her team is scary. I kind of needed the extra levels for this, which is why I opted to fight her last. Her scariest Pokemon is definitely her Blaziken, which has Reckless, Life Orb, and a full set of nasty recoil moves. This thing is the spawn of Satan, straight fucking demon. Oh yeah, and she's also got five other Pokemon to worry about. Kahili leads with Dodrio, which has a Scope Lens, Super Luck, High Crit set, and I need to bring out the big horse. I can two hit this with heavy slam but i need to slack off at certain points to stay healthy while shrugging off a few crits once that dies i need to get electros low to set up weavile so here's what i do there's a cool interaction here where the electros only goes for flamethrower because of the defense boost from stamina and it doesn't click aqua tail anymore so with a health lumberry and a little bit of luck we can get it pretty low with boosted paybacks while staying healthy with my remaining slack off pp then i go to Kamo to eject in a weavile weavile kills eel with throw chop and then it baits in the demon chicken. I can just straight up frag here with a no item double power acrobatics. Then Moltres comes out and this guy's got Inferno which has a myriad of secondary effects as well as a guaranteed burn. So I go into Vaporeon and I'm gonna try and get it low and stall it out of roosts. I chunk it for a while but then it switch AIs into Salamence, which throws me off a bit. It's something that was totally possible, but I kind of forgot in planning. We're ultimately good here though, since I can go to Beware on the Aerial 8 Strength, which it barely lived a crit from, eject in a Weavile, and then frag it with Icicle Crash. I need a little more chip to guarantee a Throw Chop kill on Moltres, so I go to Prim, let the Inferno Recoil do its thing, and then eject back in a Weavile to kill Moltres and Oricorio, winning us the fight. Was it devious to use three eject buttons? Yes, but this E4 is legitimately batshit crazy, and this team absolutely necessitated it. This was the first completed run without setup ever, and it was largely due to those pesky eject buttons. The Elite Four was so hard that most people who were running this game resorted to some kind of setup for some semblance of a clean line. Our final battle is against the champion, Kukui. This is the hardest fight in the game considering the circumstances, and as much as I would have liked to try to finish the run deathless, it just wasn't happening against this team. So I decided to minimize risk to maximize my chances of winning. Kukui leads with a Focus Sash Lycanroc. I beat it easily with Prim, although Stealth Rocks go up, but this is fine because we plan for it. I sacrifice Prim to Tapu Koko and bring in Assault Vest Beware, which can kill <laughs> Tapu Koko after the Life Orb and Re coil, uh, living a critical hit in the process. I then sacrifice it to Embor, who was revenge killed by Vaporeon. I sack Vaporeon, then chain Dekadui into Porygon Z with Weavile. Lastly, Kamo beats Mega Blastoise, winning us attempt 6 of Mesa Moon. This game changed my opinion on Gen 7. It was an absolute blast. The difficulty scales perfectly, and it finds this great balance of an inviting and easy early game with a difficult late game and downright brutal Elite Four. 
The Pokemon changes are logical, and the game has been updated since this playthrough so that some of the bugs are ironed out now. Gen 7 also has this unique moveset management challenge because the move relearner is so late in the game, and Mesa Moon handles it so incredibly well. It strikes this equilibrium of making you think about every change you make to a Pokemon's moveset, but also giving you enough tools to feel like you aren't playing with your hands behind your back. This hack really rewards good planning, and there's a line into pretty much every fight. I'd give this a solid 9 out of 10. It's really good, and it's going to continue to get better. Huge thanks to Albob for making an awesome hack. He really did a good job with this. Anywho, I'm on Twitch every now and then, and if you're interested in playing this for yourself, all the resources are available in my Discord, which is linked in the description. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe, and I hope everybody has a great day. Jude out.